because they wanted a society where they you could have a brotherhood. They didn't really want to be uh, religious with the rest of the country. They wanted a brotherhood because they felt safe and more secure by people who understood them. They're a very uh, introspective religion. They think about God in their mind rather than in preaching. They, they do some preaching, but mostly what they do is they try to speak to God within their own mind. You are listening to History Man, the platform for historians, curators, and authors to tell their stories of the American Revolution, walk in the footsteps of heroes, and proclaim freedom reigns. On today's episode, we are with historical author and novelist Dave Dowdy in reference to his book, Zebulon's Oath. So welcome, Dave. Welcome. Thank you. Dave, uh, it's a fascinating book, and uh, I must say you've done a lot of research on it. So tell Thank us you. a little bit about yourself and where we can find your book, Zebulon's Oath. I've written four novels, or five novels, rather. The four before Zebulon's Oath were detective novels. I really love mysteries, so I have a lieutenant detective in my stories. Ah, well, hopefully he's a, a very confident person. <laughs> oh, he is. He is. He has his fault, so I'm originally from Michigan, Pontiac, Michigan. I've been in North Carolina 34 years, and I really love this state. And it was only about the last six, seven years that I became familiar with North Carolina's Revolutionary War history. And I almost have to kick myself for taking that long. But it's things like that that encourage me to reach out to other people and just tell them about our history. And I say history because I assume North Carolina is part of my heritage. So, and, and that's one reason why I wrote the book, Zebulon Zoth, because there are too many people out there, long-term, maybe lifetime residents of North Carolina who don't know the full story. And they need to teach their children and the their children need to understand their heritage. Well, what's the genesis of this particular story? Okay, so um, I worked as an engineer and I lost my job in Greensboro because the company went overseas. But I found a contract job in Winston-Salem on the north side. And they have a walking track between their three or four buildings on their campus. And I used to walk there during lunch. And one day I looked over to the outskirts of the path and there's this old graveyard. And I kept thinking for the longest time thinking, I'm going to go in there. I'm going to go in there. Well, finally I did. And I found these 17th, 18th century graves. One of them was a Revolutionary War soldier by the name of William Beck. And he had a very nice grave marking that the Daughters of the American Revolution placed there. And uh, I thought, I want to see if I can learn something about it. So I did some research. I went to Rev War apps. I found his Rev War application. And by God, the guy fought at Guilford Courthouse. And I was living in Greensboro. And I was thinking about my next book. I was going to continue this detective series that I wrote. And um, so I'm thinking about my next book. But what I learned that he fought at Guilford Courthouse, and then I went to Guilford Courthouse, which is just down the street from me. Well, I just had to write something about that because to me it was a mystery. And I love writing about conflict. Well, you know, do you get bigger conflicts than the Revolutionary War? So that was the genesis of the story. So the book itself is a, uh, a historical nonfiction. Is that correct? Or how would well, you classify it? It's historical fiction. It's a novel. Okay. All right. Now, I tell a lot of facts, but I also tell fiction, but all the facts are true. Well, I like the, uh, you, you've included uh, a, a small little map uh, in there that kind of puts you into the general area of where the story happened. And you got a cast of characters section. And, and uh, if, if you have a bent on history, if you enjoy history and want to start digging deeper, I like the fact that people can and they can uh, they can take the information that you have in the book and just uh, just spend hours and hours and hours just researching those stories within that. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Uh, so was your main character modeled after a historical figure? I mean, you mentioned the person, Mr. Beck. Uh, was it modeled after him or is this just a fictional character altogether? Well, I have two main characters. One of them is Zebulon, and the other is Major General Green. And for Zebulon's part, I started with uh, William Beck. And then once you read about one soldier, you start finding out about the other soldiers. So really, uh, Zebulon became an amalgam 
of a lot of different soldiers. And I took the soldier stories for Zebulon and also some civilians of that time. I didn't use any officer stories, government people as part of Zebulon's basic story. And um, as far as Nathaniel Green, you know, it's all the, the facts, the truth, his letters, you know, the things he did, um, the works. Let's put it in perspective for the uh, listeners that are not necessarily from North or South Carolina. Give us a, a kind of a, a geography of where this particular story is in comparison to the rest of the United States. Okay, so uh, I don't know if people are familiar with Catawba River, but it's just west of Charlotte. If you take the Catawba River and go 100, 150 miles east of it and 100, 150 miles west of it, and you make a column there, a sort of corridor, and you go all the way up to northern, or not northern, but um, southern Virginia, and then you continue that column all the way down to South Carolina into uh, Charleston, that is where my story takes place. And I know it's a huge geography, but Revolutionary War in North Carolina is very little about the eastern part of North Carolina. I don't mean to slight anybody in, in Raleigh because, you know, they've got, they, they have some events that happen over there, but most of it is in central North Carolina. It is interesting how the Catawba River Valley and, and all of its uh, tributaries uh, have played such a big role, especially in the southern campaigns of the revolution. I, I, I think it's, I think that's pretty interesting to me. And of course, River systems have always, from a historical perspective, played a role in conquering nations and, and, right. and armies going back and forth. So Salem, Bathabara, Wachovia, Camp New Providence, Camp Sherall, uh, those are all in that area? Yes, sir. And, and Salem, is that Winston-Salem or is Salem totally different? Yeah, Old Salem became Winston-Salem. Actually, Winston-Salem is covering the whole area of the Wachovia Tract, which was 100,000 acres. Very big piece of property that the Moravians owned. Well, how did the Great Wagon Road figure into these settlements? Well, the Great Wagon Road figures in quite a bit because, uh, you know, I, I have as my main character, he's a Quaker. The Quakers uh, originally settled in North Carolina on the coast. Then later on, more Quakers came into North Carolina, but they came down the Great Wagon Road. Very few of them went from the east to the central part where my story takes place. Most of them came down on the Great Wagon Road from Philadelphia. And the same thing with Moravians. They came down the Great Wagon Road. And, of, of course, um, anything having to do with the Revolutionary War, uh, a lot of it took place on the Great Wagon Road because it was the great trunk line, the great highway going into the south. Well, I thought it was refreshing how you added some colorful environmental aspects to the story. Tell me, tell me what is a curved beak curlew? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so as a writer, you do research on a number of uh, subjects, and I wanted to put the reader there on the ground with Francis Marion and his militia. And uh, because it's the low country of South Carolina, I did some research and I found out about Indian grass and a few other things. But the curlew is a wading bird. It's a large wading bird that spends its winters on the coast, partly on the coast of South Carolina. And then in the winter, it goes up to, of all things, way up in Canada. But uh, the bird is great because I wanted to add some horror to the scene. And that bird, when it makes its peepee, its, its song, it sounds like somebody screaming or hollering or calling for help, things like that. A, a woman's voice, pretty much. But still, it's horrifying. And I wanted That's people a, to feel horrified by this, the scene. Right. Wow. So you included a lot of historical figures on both sides uh, of, the, yes. of the conflict in the book. Uh, tell me a little about your preparation in, in uh, writing this book in the backdrop of historical events. Well, that's a good question because uh, I knew that my audience pretty much was going to be people interested in history. Very often will you get people who just pick up the book just for the heck of it and start reading it. A lot of people, they see the cover and they see the title and they think, oh, this is history. I think I, think I want to read this. Well, everybody in history who's a fan of history has their favorites. So I knew that I had to include enough people to actually make the events sound authentic. 
And I had to include enough people so that the readers out there wouldn't say, oh, man, he left out so-and-so. And in fact, I left out a lot of people. And I really hate that. But you really have to kind of hand things in. And I, even though I have a huge cast of characters, and but I do have the, you know, the, the listing at the front to, to help the reader identify who they are and such. But that's how I started. I took a broad, you know, view of the whole situation. I read a lot of the history before I even started writing. And uh, I just wanted to be prepared to tell a story and not leave things out. Well, I'll tell you what, writing a book, writing a novel is a daunting, daunting uh, it is. task. And uh, it's filled with all sorts of pitfalls and insecurities as a writer. Uh, so hats off to you for, for making this uh, reality. And, Thank you. And I appreciate it. Digging way down into history and trying to to bring to life those stories for the the present generation. Now, we talked a little bit about where the Quaker settlements were. We talked about Wachovia, Bathabara, uh, Salem. Uh, who are the Quakers? Yeah, um, people don't know about Quakers today, and and I knew very little at the point at the time when I started writing. And the reason why I included the Quakers were because they lived in the area where the Battle of Guilford Courthouse took place. They lived in a place called New Garden, which is like a mile away from the battlefield. The Quakers are a sect of a Protestant sect from England, and they set them sites apart from the normal religion or the state religion, just like the Moravians did, because they wanted a society where they you could have a brotherhood. They didn't really want to be uh, religious with the rest of the country. They wanted the brotherhood because they felt safe and more secure by people who understood them. They're a very uh, introspective religion. They think about God in their mind rather than in preaching. They, they do some preaching, but mostly what they do is they try to speak to God within their own mind. And they like to have God within themselves, kind of like, kind of like um, Indian practices are. They, they like to have God within themselves. Whereas the Moravians saw God as this distinct being, this great being outside of them, and they came to worship him. The Quakers had God inside their head. They're very uh, plain spoken, plain uh, clothes, very plain culture. They didn't, back in the revolutionary, the colonial days, they didn't uh, honor any of the religious holidays. And all holidays basically were religious. They didn't believe in Christmas, Easter, they didn't wear anything fancy. They thought the light should come into them. They didn't be the ones to give light to the world. So very dour, strict people. So for such a reclusive group of people in regards, I mean, they certainly were not evangelical by any stretch of the imagination. No, no they weren't. Uh, did they have any political clout in Central North Carolina? Yes and no. Um, their political clout goes back to... Uh, around the middle of the 17th century. King Charles II gave them permission to practice their religion. Now, this is a country of Anglicans. After King Henry, it became all Anglican. The Catholics were out. All other you know, religious practices were out. But somehow, King Charles II gave them the freedom to practice. And when they came to uh, the colonies, they brought that freedom with them. They still retained that freedom. Now, until the Revolutionary War, whenever an argument started with a non-Quaker about, you know, who are you? Why are you practicing different, uh, a different religion and such? They always fell back on that. So that was, in a sense, their political clout. They had um, small communities that they were starting once the Philadelphia Quakers came down the Great Wagon Road. And they were developing communities like New Garden, um, Deep River, center what is the center meeting house so they had clout in their own community but as soon as that community had new settlers come in who weren't quakers that's when it started to evaporate in north carolina and south carolina they both had regulator movements uh, prior to the revolutionary war and and they they involved different uh reasons there were there was actually diametrically opposed in some ways uh one of them was re the one in North Carolina, they were upset because there was too much government uh, oversight. <laughs> and the one in South Carolina was like, you've left, uh, you left the backcountry people 
uh, with no government at all. And uh, so the regulator movements in both both states happened about the same time, but they were they had different reasons for happening. Were the Quakers involved in the revolution in the uh, regulator movement in North Carolina? Well, here's another yes and no answer, because the Quakers um, just, you know, detested violence. They didn't want to have anything to do with violence, especially war. They took their uh, feelings about war and violence from a chapter in Isaiah the Bible. So whenever it came to, you know, uh, in some kind of insurgency like that, I think a lot of them were all for it, but they definitely would not get involved. And if they did get involved, they would automatically be read out of the, the friends. The friends is what they call themselves, even though they were the Quaker religion. And one person, his name is Herman Husband. He was a Quaker. He got involved in the regulator movement in North Carolina and he was quickly disowned. So you could be a Quaker on day one of your participation in something like that in the regulator movement, but on day two, you would no longer be a Quaker. Despite that neutrality that they had, weren't there some famous fighting Quakers? N um, Major General Nathaniel Green was the most famous Quaker. Uh -huh. um, his father ret retained his uh, Quakerism until he died, but Green... Uh, just like a lot of the people in the North and South, he made a decision that it was either, you know, time to buck against the British or just fall in line with them. He wasn't, he wasn't wanting to be a loyalist at all. So, yeah, he's the most famous Quaker. Thomas Paine was a Quaker as well. Um, Thomas Paine wasn't involved in any kind of battles per se, although he was a very big writer. He, of course, he wrote Common Sense. And he was trying to tell the people, kind of like Benjamin Franklin was, that, you know, the British aren't a bad people. They're just a bad government and they want to control you. And if they control you, you don't really have your own life. Anymore. It is interesting as you go across the North and South Carolina and you go into these older communities and you see a Quaker cemetery. What you find mm -hmm. is the Quaker cemetery predates a lot of the Scotch Irish cemeteries and and uh, and many of the other settlements uh, in their cemeteries, they 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 almost were were trying to trying to flee government intervention and government oversight so much that they were the first ones in these communities. I, I think actually, is Daniel Boone a Quaker? Not that I'm aware of. Um, his his parents are buried in Moxville, North Carolina, where I used to live. That was a surprise that you know. They had an old Walmart there, and I was there with my son, and we were just kind of walking because sometimes you have to walk your kids like a dog. And we came upon this cemetery, another cemetery, and there was um, Squire and Sarah Boone's graveyard right there in Moxville, but it wasn't a Quaker graveyard. Um, Quaker graveyards are known for their spare, sparseness of um, markings. They have the name and the date when they died, maybe the date when they were born. There's usually no epitaph. And the Boone's epitaph or, or markers had epitaphs. So I knew they weren't Quakers from that. So who is Tragot Bach? Who is he? Tra Tragot Bach is a, was a Swedish man. And apparently he's somewhere back in the old world. He learned German and he fell in with German people. The Moravians are from Czechoslovakia. But they moved to Germany to escape some, you know, religious persecution, persecution there, and they uh, they learned the German culture. Well, Bach, who I renamed because his Swedish name is pronounced Baga, it's B A G G E. I thought the reader might have trouble, uh, you know, reading or knowing, yeah, pronouncing their name. And then the fact that it doesn't sound German, I didn't think fit as well. So I renamed him. I, you know, as, a, as an author, you can take those kind of liberties. And I explained all the changes that I made to the facts in the back of the book. I don't know if you noticed that. He was a very rich man. He was the leading trader of Wachovia. And Wachovia was uh, a community of Moravian people. You know, they had their planners, but a lot of people, especially in Salem, were tradesmen. Today, you call them mechanics. Or, or builders, things like that, laborers in a production line. But he had a lot of money and he had control of the community uh, on everything except the religious aspect.
I see. Who are the makers? The makers is a name that I gave the company of artificers that uh, came down from Philadelphia to uh, join Nathaniel Green when he came down to Charlotte, uh, had Providence. The makers um, made the wagons. They repaired wagons. They made weapons. Any kind of implements uh, that the that the troops needed, they were a, a supply, uh, a support team. But I, I created them number one because they existed. They were called artificers, but right. they did right. exist. But I needed them to to be the people to build Nathaniel Green's boats, which those artificers actually did. But I told a deeper story than what I had been reading in, in the history books. So one of the big uh, aspects of the, the story in the Southern campaigns is the race to the River Dan or the, the big chase uh, where Nathaniel Green and uh, Daniel Morgan's troops retreating from Calpins after their big win there. Cornwallis is chasing after their combined force of, and Nathaniel Green is trying to stay one step ahead of Cornwallis. Uh, what are the most illuminating thoughts that you have on that part of the war? Well, it's just a really fascinating thing. And like I said, there's very little in the history books about the chase, how it, you know, originated. There's a lot about how it happened and ended, but very little about how it originated. So I put in my book um, the fact that Nathaniel Green was told by uh, George Washington to have boats in his wagon train because he needed boats for retreat across the many rivers in the South. Green was going along with that story until he realized that he was going to get his uh, provisions, uh, uniforms, gunpowder, whatnot, down from Philadelphia. He was going to have to have wagons to take them down to Southern Virginia and use boats to get them down to Charlotte and wherever else he was uh, camping. So he looked at boats as a different story. When he got to North Carolina, he found out that, man, and, and I know, forgive me, the weather around here is not cooperating. It's supposed to be very rainy this time of year. But um, at that time, it was very rainy. The rivers were swollen. You needed boats for every place. You couldn't ford a river on a horse ford because they were so deep. You just needed ferries. So Green learned that story about you know how boats were important for cross, crossing rivers. He became a convert to uh, Washington. And so he had boats made. And he had them placed at strategic crossing points. So Green was all set when it came time to begin the chase. In fact, I don't say it, but I really think he was thinking ahead that we were going to have this chase. But when the chase did happen, it was because of Cowpens and all the prisoners that were taken from uh, Lieutenant Colonel Tarleton by uh, Daniel Morgan. 500 prisoners. And this is on top of the King's Mountain. So... Green knew that Cornwallis wanted those troops back, 500 troops out of something like 3,000 that he had total, big number. So Green practically dragged Cornwallis by the nose all the way up to the Dan River. And while he was doing this, he was weakening the British. He was taking them farther away from their supplies. They had to forage everywhere. They didn't know their way around like Green did. Um, they became very weak by doing this. And it was... Wow, what a strategic, brilliant ploy it was. Real quickly, in the book, you, you get to Guilford Courthouse. Talk to me a little bit about Powell's Massacre. Did, did you did you mention anything about Powell's Massacre? Yeah, I did. Um, and uh, after the chase, Cornwallis comes down back down into North Carolina proper, and Green sends uh, troops to follow him and to harass him everywhere. He knows that Cornwallis is down there to forage and to also recruit, you know, people for, you know, loyalists for his army to help him. Green just tells people, you know, he tells, he sends Lee, Pickens, a few others down there to harass the living daylights out of Cornwallis. One of the things that happens among the many skirmishes that happen between Hillsboro and Greensboro a few weeks before the Battle of Guilford Courthouse is that Lee runs into some of Tarleton's forces who are out on maneuvers, foraging mainly. And these are loyalists he has with him, and they don't recognize Lee as being a patriot. They think he's a, uh, a loyalist. And Lee lets them believe that. And Lee gets them rounded up. They're all lined up across from each other. 
And somehow the, 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 the truth comes out that these are loyalists and these are patriots. And so a battle ensues and Lee and his people just cut them to pieces. The term they used to use back then, literally cut them to pieces. Pyle was the leader of that group. He had no idea what he was getting into. In fact, he really wasn't taking his orders correctly from Tarleton. Tarleton was telling him to be very careful, you know, be sure about what you're doing. Don't even get yourself, you know, into something you can't get out. Lee had, um, of course, his forces. He had a small number of uh, Catawba Indians, probably no more than a dozen, that were working with him, um, helping, you know, with scouting and stuff like that. And they did get into a battle with Tarleton's troops at a place called Claps Mill. It wasn't a big battle. It wasn't a, it was just a skirmish, but it was these little skirmishes where Cornwallis kept losing men, kept getting men wounded. So by the time he get to, got to Guilford Courthouse, he had lost more than those 500 prisoners at Calpins. He'd lost a few hundred more. Some of them were deserting them. All. So the book is Zebulon's Oath. Uh, what would you want people to take away from reading your book? That if you get in a situation where you have to give your oath, whether you're a Quaker or not, and Quakers weren't allowed to give oaths, oaths came from God, you have to make a decision. And Zebulon was a wagon jockey. He drove wagons for his father, who's a Wainwright. He saw his father's business as being subject to British mercantilism if the British won the war, which means... The British would make the wagons and just ship them over here. And he was right. And so he had to make the decision to, to uh, enlist and take the oath. You know, he got himself into a whirlwind of, of hurt by joining up. He found out that life became hell. And I think it's a point in everybody's life where they come to a major decision. And it's, it's really tough. It really is. But you just have to lead with your heart and do the right thing. Yeah. What does liberty mean to you? Oh, that's a very good question. And, you know, when you asked the question, I started thinking, well, that means freedom, doesn't it? Isn't that freedom? And then I started thinking back and thinking real deep. And, you know, I was in the U.S. Navy a long, long time ago. And when I got out of boot camp, we had this thing called leave. And leave is, you know, it's a vacation. And then after leave, I was to report to San Francisco and then fly over to the Philippines and meet my ship in Manila. Well, when I got to Manila, I found out my ship was on R&R and they said, you've got three days liberty. And I thought to myself, well, that's interesting, liberty. And so I said, well, what can I do? They said, you can do anything, just relax, you know? So after that, to me, liberty means the ability to relax. And when you've got military and police, safety departments in your community protecting you, then you have that right to relax. And I think that's one great thing about America is that we give people the ability to relax, to be their own person, to work, worship, enjoy life, things like that. So that's what liberty means to me. So tell us how we can get your book. Okay, my book is available practically everywhere. Um, now, if you order it at a bookstore or Amazon and it's an ebook, you're going to get it automatically. If you want it as a paperback, you have to order it and it would be delivered. Um, I also have my book for sale in Morganton at the historic uh, Burke Courthouse and the Burke County History Museum. I gave a talk there last week and I sold a few books after the talk. It's in their gift shop. Well, the book is Zebulon's Oath by Dave Dowdy. Appreciate your time here today. You're very welcome. I look forward to going back and, and touching base with the facts that you have inside the book. I, I think uh, the Catawba River Valley of North and South Carolina uh, is just an unsung hero of the Revolutionary War. And quite frankly, Definitely. quite frankly, the, the birth of this nation and, and in many ways, the freedoms we have in this world. I'm very excited that uh, I was able to read this book and I hope our listeners are too. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it.